You know, we don't find meaning when we try to find it in ourselves. Meaning comes from a different place. It's a different person. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Ron M. I'm Janice. And the person I talk about is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. He is God. And I think it's important to understand that that's exactly what we're talking about today as we go through the Bible for the 33rd, actually 32nd time. I'm sorry, I'm on 33 because I'm <laughs> studying next year too. Anyway, but this is really good. And Corey is here with Ryan. Corey? Well, over the next few days, I'm going to be taking a look at different industries uh, that were utilized by ancient Israel. Today, horses and chariots. Ryan? Today, we begin the book of Ecclesiastes. So I'm going to be giving a brief introduction to the book. All right, very good. Look forward to that. Janice, what did you do? Real purpose and hope. Take your Bible guide out and let's study the Word of God and listen to what he said to us today. Ecclesiastes 1, verses 1 through 11. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanities of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, See, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Today we read Ecclesiastes 1, 2, and 3. What an amazing passage this is as we read through the Bible in one year. You know, the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes says that he was the son of David. He was the king in Jerusalem. And those words have led many to believe that the writer must be Solomon. It seems likely to assume that it was Solomon given the things that the author said and did in Ecclesiastes. Now, Ecclesiastes is a record of his research to search out the real reason and meaning of his life. He expresses his exploits through time to search for the reason to live through doubts, through hopes, through fears. Solomon was a king gifted by God in wisdom. Now, we learned that from 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9. But that does not mean that wisdom answers all of his questions. In fact, the most important question of all, why do we live at all, is actually answered not by reason alone, but that question is answered through God's Son, Jesus Christ. The first 11 verses begin our study today, while the last two verses conclude the whole question. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. As we continue reading and understand this, take your Bible guide and get it ready because today is an interesting day as we study Ecclesiastes, the first chapter. And I want to say that we're going to focus on Ecclesiastes 1, 1 through 11. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. You can believe that. And that's important to remember. That's how he starts. It's amazing. 
And as we read this and focus on these nine verses, let's look at the Bible and allow it to change our lives instead of us changing, you know, making our thoughts established. That word, that word should establish our thoughts. So, Father, I pray today in Jesus' name that you would help us as we study the book of Ecclesiastes. In Jesus' name, we need to hear you, Lord. And we said together, amen and amen. It says something interesting in the first verse. It said, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity, vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all of his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear is filled with hearing. Fascinating. Now, this brings me to the first point, and I want you to pay attention because this is really something. As we begin to study this, we do not find true meaning in anything we do. So many people are tied up into what they do, but we don't find meaning there. Our purpose comes from God. Our purpose comes from the Lord. Do you know God? Have you given your heart to Jesus Christ today? Is he the Lord of your life? It's a good question. You should maybe consider that as I should consider that every day when I get up, I, I pray and I say, Lord, I need to give my life to you today. Help me to do the right things. This is what I need to do. And so as we understand God, as he gives us the born again experience, as we get to know him, we come to the place where we begin to hear him in his word. So with that in mind, let's go on to the ninth verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. Here is what it says. That which has been is what will be, and that which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> I mean, everything happens. Technology grows, yes. Technology changes, yes. But you know what? Human nature remains the same. The Lord has called us to himself. We say yes to Jesus Christ. Will we say yes to Jesus Christ? Will you say yes to the Lord? That's my question today. As we focus on this, we are listening to a man who is brilliant and wise. And yet what he says is vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Isn't that something? We need to understand that when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, he does something in our hearts. And he does something in our life to give us life. There's something, some questions that can only be answered inside our heart when we connect ourselves with God. And we do that through Jesus Christ, who came 2,000 years ago and allowed himself to be killed by us. And then we wrapped his body and buried him dead. But he rose again three days later, alive. It's an amazing story. And he said, go tell everybody what I did for them. I'll come into your heart and I'll be the Lord of your life. He answers the question, beloved. God answers the question. Now, with that in mind, let's go on to verses 10 and 11, chapter 1. Is there anything of which it may be said? See, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. It, it's amazing how he speaks about time and, and, and we go through it. You see, there is nothing new. Human nature is the same. Every discovery ends in man's need for God. Every time a scientist said, well, there's out there, you know, there's alien life out there. You know what? There's not. God is 
that's so much bigger than our universe. He can make a number of universes, but he's got our universe isolated so that we can see him and focus on his attention, beloved. I want to tell you something. The scientists don't answer their question. They come up with more questions. They see the end of the universe and they say, well, what does that mean? I don't know. What does it mean? It means that the Psalms tells us God is above the universe. And that's something that, you know, many theologians understand. And many people of God, like you and me, we get it. And beloved, let me just say today that once we get it and once we understand that God is bigger than everything, we things get calm. The questions aren't so deep now because the Lord has answered them and we have the answer to the questions and we will know. And God begins to, he actually, it's like a stream. God begins a stream flowing in our life of knowing God by reading his word, praying with him every day. We begin to know God. And as we know God, He reveals himself to us. This is absolutely stunning. That's what we miss when we don't know God. Do you know the Lord today? Have you met Jesus Christ? He's as real as the mention of his name. Pray with me and simply say, talk to God and say, God, I need you. I believe that Jesus Christ is God. And I believe he died on the cross and rose again in the flesh. And I need you today. Forgive me of my sin. Help me in my life in Jesus' wonderful name. And this is what I pray today. And we said together, amen. Hi, Rod Hembry. We go through the Bible in one year. It's exciting. It's great. And you can join us by searching Bible Discovery TV on your phone. That's right, on your phone, your iPhone or your Android phone. And when you do so, you'll find the app. You can download the app and watch it anytime you want. Never miss a program right here on Bible Discovery TV. We'll see you there. Chariotry and war horses are mentioned quite a lot in the Bible throughout the Old Testament of the Bible and into the New Testament, right to the book of Revelation. We're getting references of war horses and their riders. Um, And earlier on in the Bible, in the time period, you know, basically spanning from the Exodus into the time period of the Kings, we get all of this language revolved around war chariots and even Israel's war horses and chariots. So today we're going to jump into this ancient industry that really involved a lot of uh, technology. Uh, Let's see what we can learn about this industry historically. Beginning in Exodus, the second book of the Bible, horses are mentioned frequently in the context of war. At first, horses and chariots are the terrifying tools of the enemies of Israel, Pharaoh's chariots and the deadly iron chariotry of the Philistines, for example. In those early days of Israel as a nation, they themselves did not possess a chariotry. But as the time of the kings of Israel unfolded, horsemanship and chariot warfare became a primary goal. By the third king, Solomon, we see Israel buying horses in bulk, building chariot cities, and organizing a centralized feeding system for the nation's horses. A few generations later, during the reign of King Ahab, two enemy nations would record on documents that still survive Ahab and Israel's unusually powerful chariot force. The Tel Dan Stella says that Ahab brought 2,000 chariots to battle, which would represent anywhere from four to 6,000 chariot horses. This seems to confirm an Assyrian record that claims Ahab brought the strongest chariot force to the Battle of Karkar, again, numbering 2,000 chariots. Scholar and modern horse professional Deborah O'Daniel Cantrell has argued for a modern misunderstanding of the archaeological evidence for horses and chariotry in ancient Israel, largely based off a misunderstanding of the needs and training regimes of horses. Her work points to the city of Megiddo as an exemplar of a chariot city, showing convincing evidence for horse stabling, including horse chewing marks on remaining feeding troughs as well as interpreting Israel's four and six chambered gates as chariot hitching stations. 
Chariot horses were a most feared weapon. They were trained to kill by trampling, and in the words of Cantrell, they were trained to be addicted to speed, which is what made them both a fearsome weapon and difficult to control in the heat of battle. Horses were also very difficult to kill, with spear, arrow, and sword wounds exciting them further and with their circulatory system allowing their drivers hours to get them back to camp to deal with what could have been deadly wounds. Horses' main weakness, on the other hand, is their stamina. Horses' exhaustion levels need to be strictly controlled by their drivers, otherwise they would work themselves to death. This meant that to battle successfully, a chariotry would need to have waves of chariots that would fight and retreat to camp for rest. Another weakness is the horse's startle reflex, which could send an excited war horse on an uncontrolled, deadly flight. History seems to show that enemy armies were always trying new tactics to startle enemy horses while desensitizing their own horses to the same stimuli. There were parts of the war horse's apparel that did help with this. Horses wore blinders to limit their vision by up to 90%, and multiple bells were incorporated onto their gear. This could have multiple benefits, helping horses match each other's gaits, announcing their presence, and creating a comforting white noise for the horses. Whether we think of the heavenly horses that accompanied Elijah to heaven, the fearsome chariot driver King Jehu, or the war horses of Revelation, it's clear that horses were tremendously important in the history of Israel. So there we go. There is a brief introduction into some of the historical work that has been done on piecing back together ancient Israel and ancient Judah's really thriving, uh, what appears to be a thriving horse industry, uh, you know, and it, it's it, it's tricky sometimes to track horses. I think, um, uh, you know, O'Daniel Cantrell's point about how it it's difficult when you don't know what a horse needs. You're not involved in the modern horse industry. You're not involved with horses. It's, it's a technology that has fallen out of everyday use in today's day and age. So it's hard for the average person or the average archaeologist or historian to look back into the historical records, to look at the artifacts on the ground and, and see horses in there. But when you have someone who's trained to do both of those things and they go back, all of a sudden they have a different perspective on it. So I, I think it's really, really, really cool and very important to have scholars that do specialize in all of these different areas. And, and horses and chariotry is just one example of that. Yeah, that's really interesting, Corey, because... Uh, as time has gone forward, technology mm -hmm. has changed, but the human nature hasn't. Yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> true. You know, I, I think it's so interesting how how quickly and how diversely technology really has changed. I mean, just when we look back at, at the last world wars, uh, war horses were used in abundance, like millions and millions of war horses. And today that's just not the case. So it's Very a technology that has completely fallen off. And yet, the, again, the human nature remains under sin. That's it does. fascinating. Uh, okay, Ryan. Mm -hmm. All right, well, today, to help us on our journey through the book of Ecclesiastes, I'm going to be giving a brief introduction to the book. Questions like, how did Ecclesiastes receive its title? Who was the author and what was the date of its composition? And most importantly, what is its message? Well, let's study. Ecclesiastes. It is perhaps the most misunderstood book of the Bible. Its title is derived from the opening word in Hebrew, koheleth, which refers to one who called an assembly. In the Greek and Latin, this became Ecclesiastes, or the preacher. Though the book is commonly attributed to Solomon, who reigned about 970 to 930 BC, some scholars believe that he didn't write it. They give a few reasons for their assumption. Among them is the fact that Solomon's name is never mentioned in the book. Also, the writer speaks as if he were a subject rather than a ruler in a time of oppression, injustice, and social confusion. They also claim the language of the book indicates a much later date than Solomon. Thus, they conclude that a later writer used a literary device known as a didactic autobiography to present his teaching. They put the date at about 250 BC. However, there is no real and hard evidence to refute Solomon's authorship. In fact, based on the clues in the text, it seems more likely that Solomon and the preacher are one. For example, Solomon had inconceivable wealth and power, 
which would have certainly allowed him to satisfy his every wish and desire, just as the preacher did in his search for meaning. The writer of Ecclesiastes also speaks of the old and foolish king, probably referring to himself, who's followed by a poor and wise youth, perhaps a reference to Jeroboam, that scheming usurper who divided the kingdom after Solomon's death. Furthermore, he also says that he found more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, something Solomon knew about all too well. As far as the message of the book is concerned, Ecclesiastes is a study in reality. Life is not a bowl of cherries. As the preacher wisely points out, life is absolutely meaningless unless we connect with the Creator. We also notice that the key phrase in Ecclesiastes is under the sun. Some scholars actually say the phrase in Hebrew means apart from God. They suggest that this term should be inserted each of the 28 times this phrase appears in Ecclesiastes. If this is done, one immediately sees the message of the book. Life apart from God is totally meaningless. Thus Ecclesiastes fittingly concludes the whole matter this way, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every hidden thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And this really sets the stage for the book of Romans, which says in chapter 8 verses 20 and 21, For the creation was subjected to vanity, not of its own will, but by reason of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. So, as I mentioned off the top of the segment, the book of Ecclesiastes is one of the most misunderstood books of the Bible. A lot of people see it as overly cynical and pessimistic, but it's actually a study in reality. Life apart from God is completely and utterly meaningless. But with God, there is meaning. Without God, there is no future. But with Him, our future is sure. And the book ends in seeming anticipation of Paul's words in Romans chapter 8, verses 20 to 21, where he says, For the creation was subjected to vanity, not of its own will, but by reason of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. You know, it's important to understand that our present sufferings that we face in this life aren't even worth comparing with our future life with the Lord. And my question to you is, are you a part of that glorious future? Well, you can be. Please make Jesus Christ Lord of your life today. He's the only way. As he himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to God except through me. He's as close as the mention of his name, and you can pray to him right now and ask him to come into your heart. I mean, God, the reason we pray is to lock things out, but that's what God does. So keep that in mind. Janice? Yes, well, I feel, Ryan, thank you for your segment and for yours as well, Corey. I feel, Ryan, with mine, I, I'm pretty much saying the same thing that you are with, with the book of Ecclesiastes. And, and really, he begins it by saying, vanity of vanities, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And we can substitute that word vanity with absurdity, frustration, futility, nonsense. And I think that I would venture to say that most of us have felt that same way at some point or another in our lifetime. I'm reminded so much, and especially these days, especially given the last couple of years of, of you know, segregation time in, in, in COVID and however you feel about that situation in the last while with businesses being closed, with churches being less attended and and the different things going on, that we were designed and created by God to be people of relationship. And not only with each other, but with God. God values and wants to spend time with us. He wants us to come to Him in everything when we've given our lives to Him. He, he wants that relationship. And we too, we too, have to have that same desire. And you know, we've gone through some very trying times in North America in the last little while, um, you know, specifically in the United States with difficulties and, and, and human tragedy and loss of life that is just heartbreaking. And, and once again, it reminds me, and I've heard it being talked about 
on the media and, and different venues, how that we have lost, number one, our spirituality with God, our communication with God, putting Him first in our life, and then not spending the time in relationship with people. These are the things. This relationship with God gives us our purpose in Him, in who we are. And then we are to extend ourselves. We are to love others as ourselves, to love God first with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but then to love others. And we can't be doing that if our noses are in the phone or on social media or think, you know how often, Rod, do we see people in restaurants or sitting in a park or sitting in a family setting and everybody's on their phone, doing stuff on their phone instead of actually communicating with people. We've lost that and we've lost that with God because then things become purposeless. Things become absurd. We're frustrated by life. But you know, it's the relationships that we will be able to continue on in eternity with the Lord. Our life here is all of those things without God's purpose within our lives. And knowing that when our life ends here, it passes into eternity with the Lord. And so let's develop our relationship with God first, and then let that overflow into our neighbors, into our community, into our family, into our church fellowship, so that we can bring as many people with us to our eternal home with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'd like to invite you to join us on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 3.30 to 4.30, Facebook, YouTube, and Bible Discovery TV, where we do our live prayer meeting. We'd like you to join us. Right now, let's pray today and let's say, Lord, help me to keep my mind that my call from you to come always to you and seek your face. That's what I need, Lord. Help me to do that in Jesus' wonderful name. And we all said together, amen.